verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray. Lord God, today, as we commit this time and ourselves to you, Lord, we ask that your spirit would move freely among us, that you would take this word that is preached, that you would engraft it into our lives, that by it, Lord, and by your grace, you would work it into our lives, Lord, that it would become a part of us, so much a part of us that we live it and we breathe it and speak it. And Lord, we ask that in all that you bring out of this word, for your word is promised to us to never return void. So we know, Lord, that your work will do a work in us, and we ask that the work that is done would bring honor and glory to you and your name. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today we're going through the second part of a message I've entitled in your bulletins, The One Thing. <laughs> the One Thing. You remember, um, and I almost hate to make that reference anymore, but there was a man who said there's a secret to life and it's one thing. Okay? There's a secret to the Christian life and it's one thing. Now, his answer was, you've got to figure that out. But today, we're fortunate. I'm going to tell you what that one thing is, and I believe it's the one thing. And that one thing is fellowship. I've entitled my message from this end, The Key to Growing as a Christian is Fellowship. Without it, I don't believe you'll grow. And I'm going to go, be more specific about that. But, uh, well, just to recap just a little bit. We, we began last Sunday. We started with the first point of this was the fellowship of relationship. Before you can grow as a Christian, you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 3, 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The beginning of that fellowship with God is to be born again. You could say that that sinner's prayer is that first prayer in faith. Now, you may have said, as a lost person, you may have said a lot of different prayers. You know, Lord, help me get a good grade on this test, even though I didn't study. You know, um, Lord, help me win the lotto, even though I can't afford a ticket. You know, stuff like that. doesn't make sense. I'm not saying you should pray for that. Um, I know Belinda. I'm going to confess something for her. Uh, at our other church, she used to try and talk to the pastor about going in together on buying a lotto ticket, you know, so that the church could win the lotto, and we would pass the plate out full and bring it back empty. But no, that's not what it's, uh, that's not what we're talking about. The prayer in faith, I love you, baby, I do. We're good? We're still good? Yeah, we're dead. Okay. Later then. <laughs> the beginning of fellowship, we need fellowship here, yeah. The beginning of fellowship with God is to have a relationship with him. So you might even say that that first prayer is like that first breath of life. Of a, of a new believer because we have said that prayer which is the key to that first fellowship the key to that first fellowship is prayer that prayer is like breathing now normally before you can breathe out you don't start by breathing out do you take a breath you go doesn't that feel good let's do that again I like to add a little extra to it but <clears throat> just enjoy the moment no, breathing in is what happens first. To me in this, and what I think is the truth here, is that inhale is that hearing from God first. This is the same truth that we had to have for salvation. If he didn't reach out to you, you could not have come to him. See, God didn't meet us halfway. He came all the way to where we were. We didn't contribute anything to it except our sinful state. And that needed repair. That needed to be done away with. That needed to be cleansed. And so God breathed out to you the word of God. And you breathed that in. You accepted that truth, that word of God. And then you breathe out. And that's that inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. That first breath begins, you know, when we, we just 
uh, were there when the baby was born about a month ago, three, three weeks ago. And uh, that first breath, you know, oh, that's just such a, a blessing. Well, it comes in, and then it comes out. Kind of pretty loud sometimes. And, um, you know, sometimes our first prayers to God and some following are pretty loud. And, um, but it's necessary to breathe that in, hear from God, and then breathe out your response to his word. And that sinner's prayer, I believe, is that first expression of faith toward God when you ask him to come into your heart. When you take him at his word, which Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when you called upon the name of the Lord, you in prayer spoke to God and asked him to come into your heart. I trust that everyone here has done that. Ask Christ to come into their heart and receive him as first Lord, that means owner, and Savior, that means he is the one who has forgiven your sins, cleansed you from all unrighteousness, and given you, as it is, that new life. And then you are born again, born into the family of God. Well, that's where that fellowship began. That fellowship of relationship began with the sinner's prayer. But most importantly, it continues in fellowship with God in our daily prayer life. Daily prayer life. You don't just breathe once a day, right? In the morning, you get up and you take one breath a day. That's good enough? No. Not some of us, maybe even a short breath. <sighs> You know, and we're off out the door. No, we breathe constantly. We are instructed in the word in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. Now, the only other thing I can think of that we do without ceasing is breathing. You can even do that when you're asleep. Did you know that? And, you know, when he says pray without sleeping, how many of you have spiritual dreams sometimes? All right, isn't that neat? Isn't that great? You know, I used to I remember a song that Carmen used to sing about that and he said he would he would dream about witnessing <laughs> you ever dream about witnessing that's cool when when you can do that well your prayer life is that daily from god's word and then breathing out to him taking in the presence of god acknowledging him in all your ways that he might direct your path and then you pray you you take it in and you breathe it out you we pray a lot of different ways you can pray for your needs. You can pray for someone else's needs. You can intercede for someone. You can help someone overcome a, 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 a troubling time through prayer. You, you can know that, that someone that you're, is not here with you, but, but you love or, or a lost person that you want to see get saved, and you lift them up in prayer, and you pray on their behalf. Whatever it is, your daily walk, what should I turn right or left, God? What should I do? It needs to be a matter of prayer. Pray without ceasing. Just like that breathing has two parts, we pray without ceasing. Inhale and exhale. Ephesians 6, 18 says this. Praying always with all prayer and a supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. Now, the supplication, I think you know what perseverance is. And some of you may be a little questionable about what supplication is. That's deep desire with purpose. Supplication, presenting those deep desires in your heart to God with purpose. And the purpose is that God can have his will in your way, uh, in your life. And he says, finally, with prayer or perseverance and supplication for all saints. So you're praying for one another there. Not just for yourself, but also for one another. And so that's where we started, that fellowship of relationship. Now the second thing we mentioned just briefly last time was the fellowship of feeding on his word. And truly, there is a fellowship in that. Feeding on his word. Turn to Matthew 4, 4, if you would please. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. I want to talk about this reading his word and Really, there's, I'm just going to share with you about three different ways of doing that. Three different ways of doing that, of feeding on his word. Matthew 4, 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, just as you know, it's important for this physical body to have bread. It is important, vital, as a matter of fact, for your spiritual body to also be fed. 
by the word of God. And that's really the only food there is for the, word, for the spiritual body is God's word. So the first way that we can feed on God's word is conscientiously. Conscientiously. In other words, feed on it daily. In 2 Peter, or excuse me, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, he begins this way there, and he says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, get this, that you may grow thereby. So we started out with that, that uh, relationship. And as a newborn baby, since you've been just born again, you're a newborn babe in Christ. That babe desires and needs the milk of the word. That new life needs the milk of the word. And it uses the word sincere or true milk of the word is what is given to us. And that's the recipe for growing up. So when he speaks of newborn, he speaks of a brand new life. A brand new life. And the only a newborn Christian can desire that sincere and true milk of the word. Now, when I say desire, that means you've got to have it. You've got to have it. It's not something you can live without. As a believer, as a true believer, you have to feed on God's Word. If you find that you're comfortable not reading God's Word, and it doesn't bother you, you never open the Word. I mean, you know, I remember uh, Lester Roloff one time, as a good old, old uh, fire and brimstone preacher. He made the comment one time that he said if the dust was blown off of the Bibles across this country, it would create a dust storm that would smother the crop. Of course, nowadays we have it in MP3 and all kinds of, uh, you know, you can get audio and I have it on my iPad right here. And several of you do. But we must have the feeding of the word so that we can grow thereby. The next thing is we need to heed his word initially. Heed his word initially. What do I mean by initially? Well, the brand new creation is that brand new life, that newborn babe. The first thing we need to do is learn to be obedient to his word. That new man with the new life has to let go of the old life. And for that, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I should have given that earlier. Because we just read verse 2 of chapter 2. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But before that, he says this. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, that is hateful, hatefulness and wrongdoing. Lay aside malice and all guile, that's trickery and deceit, all hypocrisies, stop trying to fool people, let go of your grudges, and envy, or jealousy, and spite, greed, resentment, let go of all these things, and all evil speaking, or slander, and cruel speech, hurtful comments, let go of all this, and as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. So what you've got to do then is you apply it first, you, be, you learn to be obedient, you read it, daily to feed yourself and then you live it you read it and then you live it you obey it now the first application of his word I believe is this you have to apply his word continually apply his word continually not just the one time and this is by the way why it's so important to memorize God's word he said in the scriptures let the word of God dwell in you richly now um, we could probably just, if you would allow somebody to do that, open up and show the balances of all of our bank accounts. We could see how richly we're doing certain things, right, in this world. But what does our bank account look like in the spiritual realm? You see, have we deposited anything in there? Have we memorized any of God's word? Does it dwell in us richly? Well, it must. It has to. We must apply his word, and you can't apply it if it's not there, you know. Okay, so for that, Psalm 119, and we were in there earlier. Psalm 119, verse 9 and 10. And this is what the word says. He says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Now, remember, we're supposed to let go of all those things that don't have any part in our life. Shouldn't have. They were part of the old life, but that's over and done with. Dead. So how can I clean that all up? How can that all be done away with out of my life? Well, he says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed continually thereto according to thy word. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So when you take heed to it, that means you do it. We're told also to be doers of the word and not hearers only, right? So that's his, 
his intent for this word is that you be a doer of the word, according to James. Now, God speaks to us through his word. Many of you, uh, if you're growing as a Christian, you are very concerned about God speaking to you. Now, when you first got saved, you probably are very aware that God was speaking to you. He may have even arranged events in your life to bring you to himself. And as you look back through your life, you might even be able to see God's fingerprints on many parts of your life that brought you to that relationship you now have with him. Well, guess what? It doesn't stop there. God's fingerprints are still all over your life as he continues to guide you. And he guides you through speaking to you. He spoke to his disciples. He spoke to the multitudes. He gave them God's word that they might follow and obey that word, that they might believe that word. So he speaks to us in his word. We discover, and, uh, we discover his nature, what God is really like. What is he like at his core? We discover his ways, how he does what he does. And it's, and it's really good to learn the rules of the game. You know, if you're going to play the game of life, you need to know what the rules are. It's like I tell my kids about finances. If you're going to go and work and have money and, 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 and try and pay bills, you need to learn the rules of money. You need, to be, you need to have a budget, you know, to begin with. You need to have a plan of action and things like that. Well, we need to find out what God's ways are like so that our ways aren't contrary to his ways. So we learn about his nature, we learn about his ways, we learn about his will for our life. That makes it personal. It's not just what God's will is in general, but it's what is God's will for my life. That is probably one of the most important questions any Christian asks. You'll ask it as a new Christian, you'll ask it later in your life as a Christian when maybe things start to get stagnant and you think, God, I, I must have drifted from your will. Help me find my way back to your will. And then you need to know, God, what is your will for my life? Especially if that will involves making some decisions that will affect this life. You know, there's a scripture that says no one has left houses or lands or family, that God didn't return them a blessing in heaven, that God didn't return them a blessing even on this earth. And so sometimes following God's will may mean uh, turning away from this direction. It may be quitting this job and following in a different path. I remember we had a young, young man one time, and he asked us to pray that he would find a job. Well, guess what? The first job that he was able to find was working at the Miller Brewery. Do you think that was God's will for him to go there as a, as a very young Christian, even wrestling with that in his life a bit? I don't think that was God's will, but that was the first thing that Satan threw out there. So we continued to pray. And uh, before long, while well, they got dissatisfied, he, got dis he was fine with it, but he got him a different job. He was offered a better job from UPS and he was able to be in church on Sunday. Sometimes we have to keep searching what does bring honor and glory to God. Not just the first thing that comes into our mind, but what does God want? Because sometimes God will tell you what his will is and then as you begin to try and live that will, you're faced with a choice. Will I follow after God or will I follow back in my old ways? Because one way leads closer to God, another way will lead farther away from God. And so you need to make the right decision in that. You need to know what God's will is for your life, what his nature is, what's he like, what his ways are, how he works, and what his will is for your life, and then his desire. You see, because when we go into a relationship with Christ, we are like his bride. We are his bride. And so we, we are there to fulfill his desires. What is it that would please God? What makes God happy? Not just what does he require, but you see how going beyond that to what makes God happy is really what we want to do. I mean, when you love someone, don't you want to see them happy? Don't you want to make them happy? Yeah, and that requires something on your part. That's where, you, that, well, that's where following God's will is not just a walk, but it's a work. It requires action on your part to express your love by making him happy. And so we want to know what his desires are. And then he also gives us what sustains us, you see. Because he is, as that, that husband, he's the provider for you. And so he gives you promises. And you need to, to read God's word to find out what those promises are. You need those promises that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Those promises that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those promises that sustain you that keep you going. Those promises that you can also pass on to someone else that you see who's, who's a, a, just a little discouraged or something like that. You need to know about this author of this book. 
what he's like. And as the more you get to know the author of this book, the better you understand his word. The better you understand his word. You know that, that little song that we were talking about when Linda gave us a little background about the author and, and where that song came from. Didn't it mean a little bit more to you when you found that background out? You need to find the background out about the author of this word. And you will understand his word so much more. Now, because... God does have a specific will for your life. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about Psalm 119. And I like verse 11. I'm just going to, just going to mention that one. It said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Memorize that scripture. If you want to start with a scripture, start with that one. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Let's everybody say that. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now, wasn't that easy? And it is just that easy, and it'll be a blessing to you everywhere you go. In the book of Psalms, one of the favorite books of the Bible for just about anyone who has read God's Word at any time, the book of Psalms reads like a poetic diary, you could say, of King David's life. As he grew as a Christian, as he grew, I say, as a Christian in his relationship, in his faith relationship with God. It reads like a book of poetry, a, a hymn book even, or an elaborate prayer. And, and later, this particular Psalm 119 would be used by God's people, the Jews, in their worship of God. You're familiar with what we've already read in Psalm 119. We just read the, two, the first two, uh, 16 verses, which I said were first two stanzas. Well, it's interesting about this, but Psalm 119 is about one of a dozen alphabetic acrostic poems in the book of Psalms. It's divided into some stanzas, in other words, like we have verses in a, in a hymn. It's divided into 22 stanzas. And each stanza has eight verses. And each of those stanzas begins with the, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's why it's said at the beginning there, alph. And the second one, Beth. That, if you ever wondered what that was, that's what it is. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second one, eight verses later, or nine verses later, Beth. And all the way through the book of, of uh, uh, excuse me, the, the chapter 119 of Psalms, through all of those verses and stanzas, each verse beginning with that first letter, at least in Hebrew. And in almost every stanza, of those, each every, every verse, in almost every verse of 176 verses, is a synonym, a word that is equal to the meaning of the word or promise, and sometimes they're called rulings. But in nearly every single verse is a synonym for the word, God's word, or a promise of God's promises, or one of his rulings. And in the first two stanzas, that's what we read, he establishes the basis for the entire prayer. This whole psalm is, is used as a, a prayer of worship in their, in their worship experience as Jews. And in these first two, he gives a whole basis of the entire prayer, the entire psalm in the first two stanzas. It's dedicated to God's word, and it shows his dedication to God's word in there. Notice that scripture reading again. He says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. I want you to understand something about the word blessed here. It means the same as it does in the New Testament when Jesus said, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word blessed means how happy. It means happy. We are truly blessed. When you're saying I'm blessed, you're saying I'm happy. And I'd like you to get in the habit of that. Linda says that when somebody says, how are you? She says, I'm blessed. When they tell me that, how are you? I say, I'm happy. I don't say fair to Midland, you know, because I've been to Midland, and I'm, you know, but um, beyond Midland, I'm, I guess, you know, no. I say, how happy, how happy. And people will look at you funny. They'll say, wait a minute, what right do you have to be happy? Or, whoa, I've never met somebody that was happy before. And, you know, you can answer them when they say, well, why are you happy? Because that inevitably will come out. Why are you happy? And then you can tell them. 
then you can tell me. See how it opens the door? Actually, it's a little something you can say that, that gives them, say, open the door. Hey, come on in and tell me about Jesus. Tell me what makes you happy. Well, that word happy also means how prosperous, and not just in heavenly things, but in worldly affairs. You know, God's people were known for that. He said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. Well, that also had to do with their economy, with their, their life on this earth. Prosperous in worldly affairs, enjoying the favor of God, and every spiritual happiness, enjoying intense heavenly delight. That is what happy means. Enjoying every heavenly delight. That's according to Webster. So this is a beautiful psalm that King David has given. Let me just read you a couple others because King David loved God's word and it's given to us here in this psalm 119 verse 165 through 67. He says this, 119, 165. He says, great peace have they which love thy law. You need more peace in your life? Fall in love with God's word. And nothing shall offend them. Ooh, boy, we, we could really use a lot more of God's word, couldn't we? <laughs> I mean, you, you don't have to do much to offend somebody these days. And there's all kinds. Of, you don't have to look very far either to find someone who is offended. A lot of people leave the church because they're offended at something. Sounds like if they were looking at the wrong thing. They were reading something else. They were listening to something else and didn't dominate or didn't spend their time in God's word. Because he says, great peace have they which love thy law. That is telling you exactly, if you do this, this will be the result. Nothing shall offend them. 166, Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and, I, and have done thy commandments. 167, he says, my soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. Isn't that wonderful? I love them exceedingly. In verse 103, he said, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You need to fall in love with God's word. Here's one last thing, which brings us to the last point, fellowship of fellowship. The fellowship of fellowship. What do I mean by that? Well, for that, that means obedience. And, for, and out of 119, he gives a word even that applies to that. He said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How can I be obedient to God if I don't know what his word says? If I don't know what his will is, how can I do his will? It's the same thing where you can trace that all the way back to faith. How can I have faith if I don't know what my faith is in? You see, it has to be in something. We don't have blind faith. We have faith that is based on God's promise. I like the way Romans 8 puts it with uh, or, uh, speaking, excuse me, Romans 4, speaking of, um, of uh, uh, Abraham and how he came to know God. He said that God said it and I believed it. And that settled it. Basically, that's a paraphrase, okay? That's Southern translation, okay? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Or actually, you know, if you want to be real holy, it's God said it, that settles it. I believe it, you know? Because it was settled. He is Lord before you ever claimed him as Lord. You see? We're only acknowledging him as our Lord and Savior. But it said, Abraham believed that what God promised, God was able also to perform. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. He had faith. He's the father of faith. That's preceding the law. There was faith. And the faith was in what God's word says. Well, what time is it? 52, okay, I got eight minutes to cover six minor points. Let's see if we can do it. This is, this is I, I don't know any other way to break it down in, in fellowship than these six points, okay? Six, or first one, obedience is recognition of who God is. You see, when you recognize who God is, you'll, you'll recognize I must be obedient to him. If he is who he is, then I am bound to, to obey him. I must obey him. I'm accountable to him. That's why the world wants to get rid of God, by the way, because they don't want to be accountable to God. They'll believe anything else. Now they realize that the Big Bang can't happen, 
And so they say, well, it, 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 but, but there must be alter universes. I mean, multiple universes now. So that's what uh, Hawking is saying now, that there's multiple universes. Rather than saying there's only one way that this could be as orderly as it could be, they were, they're saying that the whole universe from the very, what they considered the Big Bang, if anything, anything would have been more than 1% different than what it was, nothing like what we have today could be possible. Now that's, that's pretty amazing. They, they, uh, I mean, the, how unlikely it is, except that God did it. You don't ever wonder when you look at a watch that it had a maker, no, right? Or when you look at your TV that there's a brand name on it, that someone made it and designed it to work that way. And so that's the way it is. And <clears throat> we must recognize who God is. John 6 and 69 says, and this is the... De- the disciples speaking to Jesus, they said in, in John six sixty nine, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would take away the sins of the world, fulfill the prophecy of, of, of Emmanuel, who will save his people from their sins, going all the way back to his birth, and even before that in the prophecies in the Old Testament. He is the Son of the living God. He is the Christ, Messiah, the sacrifice lamb, my Redeemer, my Savior, my King, my Creator, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that unless you have him, by no other means can you come to the Father. So we obey because of recognition of who Christ is. And John 14, 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in verse 9 of 14, he says, Have I been so long with you, and you still do not know me? Me, Philip, he says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, because Philip said, show us the Father and we'll believe. And he said, have I been with you this long and you still don't know me? He said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Well, sometimes, you know, we we tend to, we live, sometimes our actions portray like we're, we're really atheists. And I hate to say that, but sometimes we live like there is no God. And that shouldn't be in God's people. When God's word clearly shows us how we should live. And that's what we need. That's the answer. How can we cleanse that way? By taking heed according to God's word. The next one is obedience is a test of our trust. When you obey, you're being tested. Do you trust him or not? Okay, God, you're telling me to do this. I had a friend of mine. I I shared with you about this. His name is Ivan. Um... Brent met Ivan the other day. He's kind of a, a, a nut, uh, but he loves God sincerely. God told him one time, I want you to go to the Gibson's parking lot, and I want you to lead eight people to the Lord and baptize them right there. So he got him a water trough, put it in his van, went down to the parking lot, and guess what? He led eight people to the Lord, and he baptized them right there. Now, sometimes God tells him other things. He, God, he said one time, God told him to climb that tree. Okay, so he pulls off that tree, God, yeah, he says, that's a big tree, God. Okay, so he climbed the tree, okay, okay, I'm not going to argue with God. He climbed the tree, and the further up he got, he noticed that he was holding on tighter. Now, isn't that interesting? What he learned from that is the closer I get to God, the closer, the, the tighter I need to be holding on. Not just because of fear, but, well, so that's Ivan, okay? You, you'll meet him someday, and, and you'll fall in love with him, too. But we have to trust him because we're going to be tested. That trust is going to be tested. He said in verse 10 of 14, John 14, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say unto you, I do not speak of my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his work. Isn't that wonderful to hear that? And then he goes on to say, Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever believes in me, will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Now you see, if, if you trust God, now you thought, well, that's kind of a stretch to be told eight people and go down there and win eight people to Christ and then baptize them. Well, that's the greater work. Lives were changed. 
Remember when he said to that person who was lame, he said, your sins be forgiven first. That's what people need most. They don't need money. They don't need uh, comfort. Uh, they don't need uh, uh, the ease. They don't need to ha- be delivered from that uh, situation they're in. They need to have their sins forgiven. They need Christ. Do you have enough faith to go and lead someone to Christ? He's gonna, he, when he says go into all the world and preach the gospel, that's that great commission, and we follow that along with our, the, the great commission because of the great commandment that we're supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Will you do it? Will you do it? That's the obedience part that is going to test whether you trust God or not. He said do it, and you just say yes, sir. Third, obedience demonstrates our love for him. Obedience demonstrates our love for him. Well, in verse 15, John 14, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I like to put the first one first. If you love me, settle that issue, and you will keep his commandments. But if you make that iffy on the love, if you focus on the if, I love him, well, I'm, do I love him that much to keep his commandments? Because you can look at one will mean the other. If you're not keeping his commandments, then, you're, then you really don't love him. You really can't say you love him if you don't keep my commandments because his word says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21 in that same chapter, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He it is that loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. That means make himself known to you. You really want to get to know Christ? Obey him. Obey everything about him. Love him. Fulfill that great commandment. And, and that great commandment is a tough one because it says all my heart. Now we're finite beings and we don't understand the word all. But God does. But that's okay if we don't understand how to do that because he has also given us a verse including the word all that says what? I can do all things. Or as I like to put it, I can do the things that require all through Christ who strengthens me. So I can love God with all my heart through Christ who strengthens me. Is that what I'm saying? That's not a stretch, is it? No, that's putting two together and it, it, it means the same thing. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. So not only will he manifest himself to you, but he will live with you. He will be right there with you. You'll reside together. Number four. Uh, okay, I'm going to look. <laughs> Number four, two minutes apiece now. So um, obedience is an example of our discipleship. Also important. You see, I couldn't have combined it with anything else. It's an, it's an example of our discipleship. You want to be known as a disciple of Christ? He says, you've got to keep my commandments. John, again, 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's why the second part is in there. Not just love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body, but love your neighbor as yourself, which is an example of being a disciple of Christ. That's how people will know it. If you just have love for God and you stop it right there, they'll never know. And aren't they supposed to know? Aren't we supposed to be a mouthpiece for Jesus? Aren't we supposed to tell? How do we, how do we best tell it? By living it. And the, it's lived through our obedience. Five, obedience is complete fellowship. Obedience is complete fellowship. And it also suffices to say that disobedience is not fellowship. You see what I'm saying? We can't have fellowship without fellowship. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. James, we've already mentioned this one 122 be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves you see we don't want to just be hearers only there were many that just heard the words of jesus and they came for all the miracles that were performed and when he finally told them what he wanted them to do and they couldn't continue because they couldn't be doers of the word they left him by the multitudes 
It came down to just the 12. And he said, will you also go? And, he, and they said to him, where will we go? You are the only one who has the words of life. We've got to have that fellowship so we can have that fellowship. Number six, obedience gives glory to God. And that, if I could say, is the highest of all of these. Because everything Christ did was to give glory to his Father. His obedience to the will of God gave glory to God. When you have obedience to God's word, you give glory to God. Philippians 1, 9, 10, and 11. And I would like you to take a look at that. Philippians 1, 9, 10, and 11. And he said, And this I pray, that your love may abound, yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's the day he returns. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by, Christ, by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Be obedient to him and give God glory with your life. That's my final encouragement to you out of all of this in that fellowship that you give glory to God with your life. You need this kind of fellowship in order to give God the glory. And that is our highest, highest calling, that God would receive glory in our life. So we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that instructs us, Lord, and educates us and at the same time changes us. May we be doers of your word. May we hide it in our heart. May we heed it that we might please you. And Lord, may we be obedient to it always so that we can give glory to you with our life. This is our simple prayer and plea. And by your grace, Lord, you will accomplish it in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.